And welcome to Father Spitzer's Universe at the intersection of faith and reason. And I'm Doug Keck, the gatekeeper here at the Mothership in Irondale, Alabama, where it all began in 1981. Thanks to our foundress, the one and only Mother Angelica. We want your questions sent to us at Spitzer's Universe at EW10.com. They're central to the program. Check out all of Father Spitzer's websites, MagisCenter.com, PurposefulUniverse.com, and SpitzerCenter.org. And Father Spitzer's Universe is always available on our EW10 YouTube channel and EW10 On Demand page, ever-expanding page. And while you're there, check out our latest edition, Nativity in Song, beautiful program. This music has united Christians across the continents, brought families and church communities together, celebrating Christmas and the Epiphany. See it now for free and on demand. Don't forget about the Christmas season. And of course, uh, we move on to the topic, which is a little less interesting, but it's the spiritual effects of pornography. Okay, so a tough topic taken from Father's book, The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, available now through the EWTN Religious Catalog, where Father always takes on the tough topics and the tough issues. And speaking of that, the book of the month for January, Standing Strong, Good Discipline Makes Great Teens. It was uh, from a show I just did last week with Dr. Ray Garendi. It was a lot of fun, and uh, the book's always interesting and lots of wonderful stories in it from the one and only Dr. Ray. Now we turn to Father Spitzer and once again uh, maybe pray for our great friend Lee South, who recently passed on, my wonderful bookmark producer, if you would, and, and all of the people watching. You bet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, the blessing especially of this ministry and our ability to serve in it. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us now, Doug, myself, our whole audience this day, so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. Please bless our good friend and colleague, Lee South, with your gentle repose in heaven, so great a friend, and please bless her family and all those who mourn her. We ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray amen. for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Much appreciated, Father. And of course, uh, this week, uh, mm -hmm. we've got a lot of life events happening at the end of this week including the March for Life on Friday, the, the closing Mass of the Prayer Vigil uh, at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Of course, Thursday night, they've got the Vigil Mass itself, so everything kind of kicks off on Thursday. And the March for Life itself at 9.30 a.m. We've got a wonderful new event for EW10 sponsored by the Sisters of Life and the Knights of Columbus. It's called Life Fest, the Mass. I think it's the second year they've done it. This one's celebrated by Archbishop mm -hmm. William Laurie. I think we're, we're not carrying it live because of our other coverage, but we're going to re-air it after our coverage of the march itself, most complete anywhere. And Walk for Life events on Saturday. So we've got the Walk for Life West Coast beginning at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time and One Life LA beginning at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. There's a pro-life mass from Los Angeles at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Check out EW10's website for all of that information specifically. And of course, it reminds me of the first time I met you really because you were heavily involved really uh, when we first That's met right. in the pro-life movement with uh, Camille Pauly, right? That's right. In fact, my very first show with EWTN was Healing the Culture, right. which was uh, a pro-life show uh, right. with EWTN, exactly. Right. Yeah. And then you did that mini-series for us, I think, with uh, based on that, right? When That's I think right. the first one we actually That's had an correct. audience for, for that one. Uh, That's right. Absolutely. Day, so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, back in the day. There yeah, we go. Anyway, so people should check that out and, uh, and be inspired that uh, the fight goes on and uh, we know how it turns out in the end. We just got to stay loyal and true and hang in there regardless. Uh, also, let's talk about some yeah. of the stories that are out there that make it always tough for us to continue sometimes. Sure. Uh, exclusive, let's see, the Daily Caller picked up top trans pediatric doctor admits in unearthed video that puberty blockers aren't as reversible as advertised. What a shock, right? Uh, Pat, WPATH, which is the prominent World Professional Associate of Transgender Health, physicians acknowledge that puberty blockers are more invasive than portrayed in the media and can have irreversible effects on minors such as infertility, uh, bone loss, disruption of brain development, according to the, uh, a session that was obtained by the Daily Caller. And of course, 
as you've talked about in other situations about brain development, uh, this particular doctor said, discuss how the effects of puberty suppression on adolescents developing brains is still not fully known. Obviously, teenagers, their brains are changing, they're unwiring, they're rewiring, and if we've started one kid unwiring yeah. and half rewiring, then we've changed their puberty the other way and we're unwiring. People have been trying to figure out what does this do to kids' brains? And the answer is they don't know, but they don't mind going ahead with it anyway. Well, actually, they do know a little more from European studies mm -hmm. than the American uh, um, uh, uh, physicians are letting on because uh, we know for a fact that when you start injecting huge amounts of hormones that were meant for double X chromosome uh, cells into an XY body, right, a boy's body, or you start uh, injecting huge amounts of hormones meant for um, XY cells, and you start um, in, in, into boys' bodies, and you start putting them into double X chromosome cells in a girl's body, we know for a fact that it has very damaging effects on the brain. We know, uh, certainly know, what the short-term effects are, that there is a shortness of temper, mm -hmm. there is, of course, even uh, anger, rage attacks, things of that nature. We know that it is doing something, not only uh, to the circuitry, but as um, uh, this doctor has put it, and I'm glad he admitted it, mm -hmm. but it is certainly disrupting the development of the frontal cortex and very probably the, the development of the cerebral cortex as well. So, I mean, <laughs> these are things that have already come out in European studies, but um, as I said, the, the European studies um, have already grounded um, the reversal mm -hmm. of transgender uh, therapy or gender affirming therapy in Great Britain, in Sweden, in Finland, and many other countries. Why the United States is not looking seriously at the European studies, I do not know. Mm -hmm. I think, um, of course, we do it better than anyone in America. So I guess that's the reason uh, for it. Or maybe mm -hmm. some political agenda is somehow ordering the slowdown, uh, you know, kicking the can down the road. I don't know what it would be. Mm -hmm. But for all intents and purposes, we are ignoring a lot of really first-rate right. research that looks like it's not just, you know, um, uh, the sexual reassignment surgery where we know that the suicides go up by a factor of 20 times, 2,000% right. increase in suicides according to a 30-year Swedish study. But we know also that the mortality rate, this is a European study, again, it's a 50-year Netherlands study, mm -hmm. uh, this Den Hagen study that, that, uh, that uh, basically shows that uh, the mortality rate triples once you start just gender affirming therapy, receiving hormones of the opposite uh, gender from the sex with which you were born. So you basically say, well, gosh, a tripling of mortality rate. Does that cause any concern on the part of American I mean, uh, American pediatric mm -hmm. uh, specialists? No, not yet. They're waiting for those American studies. This is a 50-year Netherlands study where they made a concerted attempt to bring down the mortality rate, and they couldn't do it after 50 years, not even by a couple percentage points. I mean, mm. are we, who, who are we kidding here? No. I mean, the, the, the word is out, it's very definitive, and by the way, as the, uh, uh, this American physician has admitted, um, it is uh, generally, a lot of it is irreversible. Not all right. of it, but a lot of it is irreversible, and so people should know right. this going in especially parents of people who are pre of uh, children who are pre adolescents are you kidding me mm -hmm. you really want to go into something heads up knowing there's going to be a 20 times increase in suicide rates for uh, for sexual reassignment surgery and you really want a tripling of mortality rates uh, for uh, a gender affirming therapy mm -hmm. and you really want this kind of uh, sort of brain dysfunction where all of a sudden you find um, that you know you're, you're, you've got very very short tempered children who are uh, basically uh, not just moving from anger mm -hmm. but almost look bipolar without a diagnosis of bipolar they're going from anger to depression you go I wonder what's wrong pumping in the wrong hormones in every cell of the body let's start with that but the point I'm trying to get to is the research is there we should know better but above all if you know parents are even remotely seriously considering this 
please give mm -hmm. them the research that I have um, uh, in that book, uh, The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic right. Church. Please also, I'm happy uh, to send um, uh, just the summary of it that I have in our uh, Moral Challenges in the Modern World. It's the uh, uh, Sophia Institute for Teachers. We've made a, a course for seniors in high school, a senior year elective that has all the data on um, not just uh, you know the trans uh, mm -hmm. gender uh, movement, but also homosexual lifestyle and all the other things for which the the Catholic Church is roundly criticized. But of course, in the end, all the secular surveys, all the secular research and studies that um, are mm -hmm. out there, uh, basically from places very friendly uh, to the transgendered and so forth, mm -hmm. all of them show a huge decrease in emotional health. That is to say, significant increases in depression, mm -hmm. anxiety, suicides, suicidal contemplation, substance abuse, um, and of course, antisocial aggressivity, f familial tensions, significant mm -hmm. increases in all those factors simply because um, you're, you're uh, uh, moving against, acting against mm -hmm. uh, these uh, um, uh, uh, teachings that the Catholic Church has given us on morality. I mean, all those things are not emotionally healthy. They're actually leading to emotional mm -hmm. dysfunction on a variety of different levels, not to mention spiritual health, which significantly decreases. You know, it's not just the depression, anxiety, et cetera. It's also, of course, the spiritual health. And spiritual health and emotional health run hand in hand. Mm -hmm. It's not just the couple that prays together stays together. The person that prays actually has much better uh, emotional health. And of course, I don't have to tell you, relational health-wise, if you're angry all the time, um, you know, let's face right. facts, uh, that, that leads to relational difficulties and challenges. Right. So, I mean, there's nothing really good about disobeying the, the church's uh, uh, moral teaching. And today mm -hmm. we're going to talk about pornography. Right. Well, you want to talk about an increase in depression rate right. <laughs> and a decrease in spiritual life. Boy, that'll do it. I mean, this is a portal for the evil spirit if ever there was one, but we'll talk about that right. later. Absolutely. Uh, another story out there, and I, I, I thought it was interesting uh, just because of the connection at the end of it. Uh, it's about a Catholic priest who ended up kind of uh, running away with some high school girl, etc. It was a, kind of a bad story, and he's been laicized, etc. But what I thought was interesting was he was only 30 years old, was ordained just two years ago. He was known to speak frequently on the subject of demons and exorcism. And I thought, you know, I wonder, you know, if, if that kind of a focus for anybody, even a priest uh, at that young age, is, is, is telltale signs that somebody could be getting themselves in trouble. Oh, I think maybe so. I think, uh, first of all, you know, a fascination mm -hmm. uh, with demons. Now, of course, I've studied it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, being involved in, in uh, forms of deliverance ministry and also, of course, um, uh, you know, writing about it in my book, Christ versus Satan in Our Daily Lives. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I did uh, have to study it. I did research it uh, quite a bit. But it's, you know, there's a very short line between researching it and then suddenly becoming fascinated with it. And before you know it, the very demon you're trying to defeat is already seducing you uh, in a way with, um, you know, the arts that he has. If you're an insecure personality or you don't have a, a really deep and wide faith in the Lord and you can just know the beauty of Christ's light, versus the abject ugliness of uh, the evil spirit's darkness, if that's just not ingrained in you, and you're, studying, you're, you're starting to do research in this area, oh, believe me, the power stuff, the knowledge stuff, the, you know, things like that, it just becomes fascinating. You don't think you're being seduced into it, mm -hmm. but you can be, and uh, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, somehow he got fascinated, starts looking into these things, and all of a sudden, all those great rationalizations of horrible conduct, right, mm -hmm. suddenly become so easy. You know, the devil is at your elbow, as it were, and he's just sitting there going, you know, it's not so bad. I mean, mm -hmm. she is, after all, 17 or mm -hmm. 18, and 
you're just 30. <laughs> what do you mean? Right. I mean, any normal person, <laughs> you're just a priest. I mean, any normal person would be diving for cover. Right. But once you're, you kind of let yourself get seduced into the darkness, you get seduced right. into the rationalizations. And once you're into the rationalizations, you start believing right. the logic of darkness. It really, I, I shouldn't laugh, it's terribly tragic, and it does happen. And so, of course, not, you know, I mean, uh, you're, you're never going to escape uh, apostles or mm -hmm. disciples who do wrong things. Right. Jesus had 12 apostles, and one of them betrayed him. Right. So uh, there you go. I mean, you're not going to always have a perfect ministry, no matter, you know, right. if, you know uh, if Christ is the light, and he is the light, no matter whether, you know, uh, Christ's light is absolutely salvific and leads to love and goodness on an unparalleled scale because he's unrestricted and infinite. That is true. Right. But of course, all that stuff can be summarily disregarded in a moment of abject rationalization that leads you into the darkness. Right. Anyway, okay. there it is. Uh, in, a, in a similar <coughs> related story, it's from our church pop site, uh, and, uh, and I guess it has to do with a particular song uh, the Consequences of Blasphemy. Uh, an exorcist responds to little Nas X, I don't know if it's Nas 10, and Hollywood desecrating Christianity. And it basically picked up, I guess, he's got some song called J. Christ, which apparently is quite blasphemous, mm -hmm. uh, and, noticed, and, and relates it to others who have done this kind of thing in the recent past. And his mm -hmm. point was, uh, this ex particular exorcist talking about the fact that you, you're really putting yourself at risk when you start this kind of mocking of the Lord, including, uh, you know, putting yourself on the pathway to hell. Um, what's your thought yeah. about why, is it just rebellion that you get this? Uh, what drives this? Well, I think it's, it's threefold, and it could be a combination of all three, uh, uh, for all I know. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, rebellion is always a big part. Um, you know, and uh, you know, but secondly, I think people just start, um, you know, listening to. Uh, you know, I had a student once who just say, "Well, you know, I really like uh, some song called Nephilim or something like mm -hmm. that." Uh, as a student of mine in Georgetown, and and I'm going, "Well, why do you like that?" Uh, you know, and he goes, "I don't know. Uh, I mean, just uh, you know, it gives me a a good sense, a good feeling, you know." And I said, "Like a power feeling?" Mm -hmm. Or uh, he says, "Yeah, you know, I feel." <clears throat> you know, empowered. I feel uh, uh, just, you know, uh, like uh, I, I'm, I'm me. I'm in control and, mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. So I thought, oh boy, <laughs> you know, from there to domination of others really brings me a, a whole lot of happiness. So I'm beginning to think, I don't think I listen to that too much longer, you know, but there is, again, the, the fascination aspect along with this empowering feeling uh, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think a lot of people also get into these things because they're trying to either get into a group. And by the way, Hollywood uh, filled with, you know, get into the in crowd. I mean, of course, you got great people in Hollywood. You've got your, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jim Caviezel's and mm -hmm. so forth, who are really wonderful people. But you also have, uh, uh, you know, let's say a, 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 a large number right. of non-Jim, almost anti-Jim Caviezel's uh, that are there. And uh, you can clearly see um, with uh, some of them that in order to kind of get in to the in group, well, you know, why don't you, we're just doing a little uh, uh, activity here uh, this evening, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, it's just, a, I mean, it's Satan, or it's really nothing, uh, you know, but I mean, uh, you know, why don't you come over? I mean, uh, uh, you belong to a really good group if you did, right. and uh, so you get the, the point that people get dragged into these things, and not just in Hollywood, you get dragged into them all over the place. Right. There are covens all over the place, there are all kinds of satanic a place. I mean, why does every di uh, uh, diocese now have an exorcist? Why does uh, all the big ones have two exorcists? Mm -hmm. Pretty clear, because they're needed, mm -hmm. because this kind of activity, occult activity, is going up. And people are joining. They don't know. They're just like lambs led to the slaughter. Uh, they're told that this is not going to make any difference. This is just like a, a fun deal. It's a way of getting into a great group of people. Mm -hmm. You're going to want to meet them. And the next thing you know, you're seduced. Right. Uh, the next thing you know, uh, you're in it. And you're not getting out of it easily. Right. And so um, that's, uh, that's a third area. And uh, by the way, it could be all three.
Right, a lot of minor decisions that, that come up to one major change. Mm -hmm. So, And then you find yourself, yep. when you wake up, uh, how deep you're actually in. Here's one other story before yeah. we get to our, uh, our topic for today. And uh, speaking of hell, uh, the Pope recently uh, made a statement. He said, what I'm going to say is not dogma or faith, but my own personal view. I like to think that hell is empty, at least I hope it is. And, you know, some people express concerns, though, you know, people, other people have said it at times in the past that uh, they, you know, von Balthazar is known for that, et cetera. Uh, but this story, and I thought it was interesting, and this was written by Amy Wilborn, was focused on a different aspect of that. And since you're a teacher and an educator at heart, uh, her point was, mm -hmm. have you ever been a teacher, specifically a teacher of religion, teaching the tenets of that religion to young people, what we call a catechist, even a catechist for adult inquiring Catholics or parents coming to baptism preparation classes? What's your job? Your job is to convey the teachings of the church. That's it. Not to roll with your yeah. own opinions, views, or even the nuanced, maybe idiosyncratic way you come to interpret things. And I guess that that was the point is that, you know, sometimes these statements and it's like, well, that's true. You can do that. But it's easy for people mm -hmm. to misinterpret uh, these kind of opinions from the teaching authority when you're talking to somebody who's your teacher or the principal of the school or somebody else who represents an authority. Uh, you know, it gets lost, mm -hmm. especially that nuance in the media. Right. Oh yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm not. I, I didn't read Pope Francis's statement, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not uh, commenting on that. But I mean, I do think two things. Uh, the first thing, uh, just with respect to the educator's perspective, uh, number one, you really got to separate your own uh, opinions. Um, you can mention that to you know collegiate or mm -hmm. uh, higher secondary school students and things of that nature, but you have to do it with appropriate qualifiers. Um, I think uh, Pope Francis did say it's a, it's a personal opinion, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, you know, uh, modulates the, the effect. But the second thing is, on the hell doctrine specifically, mm -hmm. uh, I would just say two things um, that I just have to mention to people when I talk about it. The first thing is, is you are a free individual. And, it, you know, even though we have absolutely no idea if anybody's in hell or what the population statistics are of hell, et cetera, et cetera, even though we have not a single scintilla of knowledge, if you've got a free human being who is capable of rebellion, why wouldn't we believe that there are some people who would just say, I'm never, just like, you know, um, the portrayal of uh, the evil spirit mm -hmm. right in uh, a paradise lost mm -hmm. where the chief devil there uh, is uh, basically saying you know non uh, servium you know I'm not gonna uh, genuflect uh, uh, period to anybody I'd rather spend the rest of my life in hell well, I mean even if God were to sit there and give all the consequences mm -hmm. could human freedom allow somebody to rebel so purely that they would uh, basically choose death, choose darkness over light. Uh, it's possible. I have to say that, you know, I think it's not just possible. It's, you know, I look right. at Judas who had been exposed to Jesus. I just think, <laughs> why? Mm -hmm. Well, you could be mad at him, you know, you could be rebelling. Uh, you could be saying you're not taking the right political opinion. You should be using your power to destroy Rome and look at what you're doing. You're just letting these guys walk all over your country, et cetera. You know, who knows why he did it? But I just have to say that opinion may be a hope, but I don't think mm. it's grounded too much in right. reality. I've just, you know, read about too many Hitlers and Stalins and Pol Pots. Right. It's just not likely. And I'm not saying uh, they're in hell uh, either. Uh, uh, they could all convert at the last minute, but I'm thinking to myself, the reason Jesus gave us a lot of talks about wailing and grinding right. of teeth is because I think he thought there might be right. some people heading in that direction. Right. So yeah. I'm just going to leave it I, at that. I would think, uh, you know, our Lord wouldn't talk about the fact that there are very high cliffs here you might fall over if there wasn't a possibility that if you didn't pay attention, you could fall over. Uh, it would strike me like That's right. that wouldn't be a That's good, the point. <laughs> good use of his limited time here on, on Earth. So yeah. let's get to, let's get to some go. questions from our, our, our viewers. Uh, dear sure. Father Spitzer, 
If God forgives and forgets our sins and puts them away from us, as far as the East is from the West, then what does the debt incurred by sin actually mean, and how can we pay back a debt for something that's been forgotten? As a lifelong Catholic, I could never understand this apparent contradiction. Please explain in simple terms. I really failed at explaining it to my non-believing husband. This is Caroline. Well, Caroline, first of all, there is, of course, a debt incurred by sin, and that debt, um, you know, is uh, uh, certainly, uh, I mean, you might say it's to God indirectly, but of course, it's the evil spirit who, uh, you know, thinks that uh, you owe him since you have uh, uh, bitten of his apple, as it were, if I can put it that way. I know the tree was actually planted by God, but uh, to misuse the analogy. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is Christ paid that debt. 100 percent so you are freed from that sin the second thing is is the debt incurred by sin is a debt also that affects you something happens to you the more you kind of sin the more you get on the pathway christ can right now wipe out that and does in the absolution of confession right mm -hmm. i mean it it's gone it's wiped away you don't owe any bill to satan christ already as it were paid the bill i mean you don't owe anything uh, there uh, uh, god of course wants to forgive you if he's uh, you know allowed mm -hmm. his own son to be sacrificed uh, in order to do this, then, of course, you should have hope that that absolution in this in sacramental confession uh, is definitive. It's absolute. Mm -hmm. There's an, an, um, God's going to put it as far away as the east from the west. However, mm -hmm. there's still effects on you. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, if the longer you kind of move into this stuff, the longer you're kind of in the darkness. Have you ever noticed it takes longer and longer to get over it? you're still so vulnerable the more you enter into the lifestyle right the more you're vulnerable to go right back to it the more you're vulnerable uh you know and the, don't think that the evil spirit won't just keep bringing it up and bringing it up and bringing it up he will he will he will if greed's your deal even though you've turned a new leaf he's gonna keep you know as Ignatius calls it, mm. he's like the enemy commander who's looking around the fort for the most vulnerable position. And when he finds it, and of course, if greed's the deal, th he's going to hit that spot full on and he's going to try and get you. So the, the thought is, well, what can, uh, does God's grace in, um, help us? Yes, mm -hmm. the Holy Eucharist, in my view, I mean, of course, the, the sacrament of reconciliation, which breaks the grip of the evil spirit, which does forgive your sins, that's, you know, absolutely essential. But then frequent reception of Holy Communion, um, you know, that the, the debt, you know, that's, as it were, in you, mm -hmm. that healing that needs to be done to you, that Eucharist is very transformative. As I said before, when I went to college, mm -hmm. I was not the nicest guy in, on planet Earth. Uh, power, money, that was more my thought. Uh, I did like, you know, I got hooked on going to Mass, thank God, um, by kind of a, mm -hmm. a sheer competition mm -hmm. with somebody. And then, and then I started, you know, after Lent was over, I, I just kept going. And I think that really had a transformative effect mm -hmm. on me, and it kind of got me over myself, over my ego, over my arrogance, over the money lust, and so forth and so on, and basically uh, there was a, a real transformative thing. So the power of the Eucharist is very helpful. Uh, just being concertedly focused mm -hmm. on this is really important. Making your religion the most important thing in the world. Even if you do get sucked back into it, mm -hmm. of course, despair is not the option. If you get sucked back into something, you turn right around, go to confession, and start all over again, and make that concerted attempt, and the grace of God will be with you. And the more mm -hmm. you receive the Holy Eucharist uh, in a worthy fashion, the more I'm telling you, uh, you're going to start getting out of it. But my main point is that, um, you know, we, there is a debt there uh, as well. It's mm -hmm. kind of in you. And um, you, you kind of say, I'm not going to be affected by the darkness. It's like, why does Christ say that the gates to the, uh, to the netherworld are wide and uh, easily, you know, perdition mm -hmm. are wide and, and um, easy to get to, 
Um, and the reason is, is because they are open right. wide. They are easy to get into. But the point is, is if you fail, you go in there, you can always, God's provided this, uh, Jesus provided the sacraments, right? He's given us confession. He's given us, right. um, uh, you know, the church. He's given us uh, the, uh, the Holy Eucharist, his body and blood. But the further you start going into that big, wide, pleasing right. tunnel, the harder it is to turn around. Right. So the main thing is, is don't think there's not a debt accumulating in your very Absolutely. being. Absolutely. Now, uh, does that mean we, that uh, God is retributive and he's got to pay you back? No. No. It right. just basic, you know, God's not sitting up in heaven going, great. You know, Spitzer's turned around, but he still owes me. So the first chance I get, I'll bust his chops. I mean, well, this we're gonna is not the we have to bust into the show right here, Father, okay. so we can take our break. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, right. So you used your allotment for the first part of the show, but there's plenty more ahead, and there's plenty more for all of you to enjoy as Father continues answering your questions right here on Father Spitzer's Universe. Stay with us. Welcome back to Father Spitzer's Universe. Our topic today will be spiritual effects of pornography, taken from Father's wonderful book, More Wisdom of the Catholic Church. But first, we're going to get to some more questions. Dear Father Spitzer, should Catholic parents shun their adult children who are living in sin? That is, take a stand and lovingly explain we can't have them in our, our home together, even non overnight, until they get married. This is Teresa. This is, I'm sure, something that's a lot of families, Catholic families deal with. Yeah. Well, Teresa, just after I said, you know, uh, uh, you know, maybe curb my own opinion, so I'm going to give you my own opinion <laughs> here. Uh, this is certainly not a church teaching, but I don't think you should shun your adult children, mm -hmm. uh, even if they're living out of wedlock, things of that nature. Um, you know, if you have a chance to connect with them, if you have a chance to um, you know, see, allow them to see you in your happiness, right? Mm -hmm. Because let's face facts, we know what the results of cohabitation are. We know the longer they cohabitate, the more their religious commitment will decrease. We know the more they cohabitate, the weaker their commitment toward long-term, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they enter into marriage with the sliding effect, they'll have a very weak commitment going into that marriage and then it'll break up. But the interesting thing is, is that cohabitating religi uh, uh, relationships, even though the parties don't believe this to be the case, we now have the psychological uh, research to show that it is a much more stressful relationship. Mm -hmm. The reason for the stressful relationship is that you don't have the emotional intimacy that comes from a public permanent, exclusive relationship, that commitment alone and that determination to carry out the commitment is the, like the glue mm -hmm. for many years <clears throat> to create that emotional intimacy. That's the bonding, that, that strong feeling. It's not just an empathetic feeling. It's a strong feeling of bondedness that is so great that uh, truly people will make s a complete sacrifice of themselves mm -hmm. for the other. I mean, it's not just that they identify with the other in empathy or they want the good of mm -hmm. the other uh, in empathy. They actually would give their lives for the good of the other uh, if, it were, if it were needed, right? It's like the parents bond with their children. Mm -hmm. That bond happens between the spouses when and generally only when you have a permanent, um, public, exclusive commitment to one another. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've got it, and you got the glue, you got the emotional intimacy, you got the determination to make it work, the determination even to, do, to be self-sacrificial, hey, that's a great thing. And, you know, stress levels lower in that case. These are from the Thornton studies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but if you don't have that, the stress level goes way up, and when the stress levels go up, what winds up happening is, let's suppose the 
couples is, oh, you know, uh, we better get married and, and so forth and so on, and then it slips over. Well, you know, for all intents and purposes, that stress level just goes right into the marriage, and of course, it's not mm -hmm. going to upset just the satisfaction within mm -hmm. the marriage. It's going to upset the longevity of the marriage and increase the divorce rate. But there's one other thing that, you know, has to be viewed. And, of course, couples will never admit it. Not only is the religious commitment going down, remember, where religion goes down, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation goes up. So there's a direct correlation, like doubling and tripling of depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. suicidal ideation, substance abuse going up. So now uh, you've got religion going down, you've got a higher stress level in the cohabitating relationship that will get passed on to any future marriage. Then you've got the problem of gender asymmetry. Mm -hmm. Let's face facts, ladies and gentlemen. When a woman goes into a cohabitating relationship, she secretly wants the permanent um, enduring exclusive commitment. She's there to promote the possibility mm -hmm. of marriage. When men go into cohabitating mm. relationships, by the way, this is called gender asymmetry. Mm. Gender asymmetry. When men go into cohabitating relationships, they're trying to delay. You can see the heel march ground into the mm. carpet. And eventually what that does, even though the couple won't admit it, right? Got to be civil to one another, keep our bills together, so forth and so on. But even though that couple's not going to admit it, they're grinding on each other mm. and their families are grinding on one another. So much so that oftentimes the family of the girl will say to the cohabitating man, will say, well, what are you going to do about uh, Janie there? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about Mary? Uh, you know, in other words, Mark. you know, like, get with it. You know, she deserves a, a commitment of so some father, sort are, are because, you, of course, the guy's you, delayed for five years. Are you trying to say that there's a difference between men and women? And the way they think about things? I'm trying to say oh, this, okay. which is acknowledged, by the way, <laughs> in about 10 significant studies, gender asymmetry is a proven fact. And it's not only a proven fact, it's killing the couple, the people in the couple. So when you finally look at this mm -hmm. whole picture, right, you've got, um, uh, you know, two people who are not going to admit it. They're going to look like everything is just peachy keen. But they've got a much higher depression, anxiety mm -hmm. level. They've got a much higher stress level and anger level. They've got, you know, they're really at implicit loggerheads, so they're not explicitizing it. Their religion, which is their main bonding for maintaining emotional stability in tough situations, is declining with each passing month of the cohabitating relationship, if, if the Thornton studies are correct. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's all the case, then uh, pretty much you, you'd have to say, well, gee whiz, um, you know, uh, let's invite them over to our house mm -hmm. and, you know, the parents, and let's let them take a look at our relationship. Of course, we have ups and downs. Of course, we've had our disagreements and fights. Of course, the children have done this problem or that problem. Of course, there's been these temper tantrums. But they're going to recognize mm -hmm. something that is intrinsically desirable to everybody. Well, what's that? <laughs> a really emotionally intimate, strong, bonded, self-sacrificial relationship. And what's so good about that? Well, it's not just good for the couple, though surely it's good for the couple as individuals and as a couple, but it's good for the children. Mm -hmm. Don't think for, you know, uh, for a second that the children of cohabitating relationships are as stable as those in marital relations. And by the way, you know, uh, you know, children of divorce, right? You get, you know, the, the, the stress levels of those kids, the destabilization of the personality, and of course the rebellion mm -hmm. of the boy moving toward criminal activity is, you know, is significantly increased. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for the good of the children, you're going to see, just give them an example. You don't have to preach at them. If you invite them to the mm -hmm. house, treat them just fine. They, don't worry. They know where you stand. Right. If you're a good Catholic, if you've taught these things to your kids, they know where you stand. Just give them the example right. of good permanent exclusive commitment. And when they just say, wow, you and mom are real, uh, I mean, in this case, uh, you and dad are really, you know, much, uh, um, you know, you're so committed and, you know, mm -hmm. you really did a good job with us. Just say something like, well, it's our faith. Right. We tried to live Absolutely. our faith and point, just put the period right there, 
And don't that's have the to big say, hurdle. and my faith gave me these marital norms yeah. that enabled me right. to do. Blah, 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 blah. Don't preach. Yeah. Just just let them see, and you'll see. You might be able to convert them, but right. just remember this: the longer they go habitate, the greater right. um, the chance uh, that it's going to um, uh, be a permanent cohabitation right. till a breakup, or uh, if they do get married, the longer they cohabitate, the more un, um, un, you know um, dissatisfaction they'll have in marriage. Right. The more um, the right. longevity will will uh, decrease, and the greater the divorce. To be topical, you can uh, yeah. maybe love the individual uh, without blessing the relationship that's going on there. So uh, kind that of is correct, that, and right. just uh, and you can believe me when you uh, when you say you know um, I love you, that doesn't mean I accept. Uh, right. the um, the relationship outside of marriage your they action. know this if you've lived your faith you can be sure they're aware right. of it so you can say I love you you can definitely say I just hope the best for you and uh, if you ever need anything you know uh, right. connect with me absolutely. and that's keep that door open absolutely so one quick uh, question before we get to, to our topic uh, uh -huh. it's highly relatable to people who've worked in media and radio and television over the years at least but in my prior existence it was anyway. Dear Father Spitzer, is it a sin to emotionally let loose a four-letter word on rare occasions? Uh, doesn't happen here at EWTN, <laughs> but I can tell you it happened a lot in my prior <laughs> life. Uh, now this person says, when I'm driving, I sometimes forget to be patient and tolerant. This is Cliff. Join the club, Cliff. But, so he wants yeah, to know about that. Well, Cliff, uh um, you know, uh, well, uh, you know, you know, in my priesthood, it, of course, that uh, declined a little bit. But uh, I must say, uh, in a former life, uh, <laughs> I probably had my fair share, and that certainly has. Uh, uh, every once in a while, it uh, escapes my lips mm -hmm. when I see, uh, uh, you know, the H word comes out. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, and every once in a while, the S word comes out. I must admit, um, but. Um, uh, normally, I'm taken by surprise, mm -hmm. and my technique is try not to, you know, just be prepared. Find something else uh, you can right. say that, that. Uh, but I de definitely don't take the Lord's name in vain, and right. don't use that other word that, uh, you know. Um, right. Um, I'll just leave yeah, it. We'll at leave that, it right there. That we don't want to get any more right. any more emails yeah. or, or letters to us than normal. Yeah. Uh, so, so let's talk about one page yeah. one forty eight uh, spiritual effects of pornography mm -hmm. from your your book and start off with uh, this point. Uh, you say we can rationalize pornography as a victimless and minor among sins because so many people are doing it and social norming suggests the mainstream acceptance is equivalent to moral mm -hmm. acceptability. Now you say pornography is contrary to the will of Christ for us and marriage. Okay, but you know, somewhere in the church recently we've heard some positions taken that, well, the kind of the sins below the waist are really not the real major sins that we should be concerned about. And of course this impacts the sins above, below the waist, but quickly impacts everything else, doesn't it? Yeah, well, first of all, that's totally wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just clarify it on five levels with respect to pornography. First of all, pornography is the quickest growing addiction by far, not just in the U.S., but in the world. We've moved from just in the last 20 years, pornography is about a 2% addiction in the, uh, in the country. We've moved to a 10% addiction rate compared to a 5.8% per, uh, addiction rate for um, alcohol and 6% for drugs. So it's now almost double alcohol and drugs, but it's the habituation rate too. I mean, pornography, you know, like alcohol, uh, alcoholics, they can start drinking a lot and then move to, you know, alcoholism where they're full on addicted and denying and doing all the denial. Well, in, in the case of pornography, habituation is much faster and much greater. So the, the point is, is if 10% are in our country are addicted, you can be sure that another 15% or so mm. are really habituated and just on the brink of addiction. Now let, and let me just give you some statistics um, with respect to habituation. So that's one level below addiction. Somebody who, be, if women become habituated to pornography, I know that sounds crazy, but they do. Right. Uh, I mean, more men obviously become habituated than women do to pornography, but yet 
let's say if a woman does become habituated, her odds of getting a divorce are triple. Mm -hmm. If a man becomes habituated to pornography, just habituated, not addicted, habituated to pornography, his divorce rate goes up uh, uh, 2.1 times, so uh, just a little over double. So you've got a doubling of the, uh, of the divorce rate for men. Now, um, then you start looking at, well, what happens to their financial stuff? Uh, a 58 percent uh, increase in significant financial loss when the pornography habituation occurs. And it's not just hmm. from, um, you know, buying more and more and more expensive pornography and going, getting involved in riskier and riskier uh, sexual behavior and hmm. things of that nature. It basically makes you careless in everything. Hmm. It numbs the conscience. It numbs the conscience. And as you were just implying, Doug, when this begins to happen, once you start rationalizing serious uh, a pornographic habituation with some really serious content that's, you know, immoral on several levels, including violence, you start looking at this thing and, and just the sexual aggressivity and violence that is intrinsic to this stuff, you can tell why there's a 58% financial loss. There is a tripling, 33% increase uh, in job loss mm -hmm. with just habituation to pornography, but it's the kids that get killed and it's the marriages, uh, you know, what happens inside the marriage. That's really, let me just explain mm -hmm. each one of those and just, uh, you know, give you a sense of it. With respect to um, the marriage itself, um, most of the time the, the injured spouse is the woman. And basically what they report, and this is a series of studies done by this guy Fagan and so forth, and they basically uh, show the, the following. Uh, number one, the woman feels like um, there's another sexual partner uh, in the house. Mm -hmm. Even though it's an inanimate object or movies or whatever the person is addicted to, she feels like, you know, that's it. She doesn't count anymore. Number mm -hmm. two, the emotional intimacy level with the spouse go goes like, you know, precipitously downward. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't just affect the other spouse in the marriage, it affects all the kids. In other words, when I become numbed in conscience, I also become numbed in my empathy, my just my genuine human desire uh, to, 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 to be at one with a person, to have one feeling with a person, to support a person, to care for a person. All these things require emotional intimacy. Well, if the in, in, emotional intimacy level is going down for the spouse, imagine the kids. Kids notice everything. I mean, if your emotional intimacy, like if you're so preoccupied with pornography, right, what, what's going on with the kids? I mean, you're going to take less of an interest in them. You're going to have less of a feeling with them. And like I said, little kids, they got receptors. They just <laughs> know right away your disinterest. They don't, you know, they notice that you're not caring as much as you used to care. And what does that do? Destabilize, destabilize, destabilize those kids. And so, uh, again, uh, pornography is a, just a destroyer. And when the mom is doing this, because she's addicted, the kids, the emotional um, uh, stability, uh, you know, and the uh, intimacy with the child goes down precipitously more, creating greater negative effects in, in stability. So that's just, uh, the, then right. take a look at, okay, so you've got pornography in the household. You think, oh, I've got covenant eyes and my kids will never discover pornography. That is wrong. The moment the kid gets the idea that there's pornography in the household, whether he can get to it or not, the point is, at school, his buddy goes, hey, you know, take a look at this. And you can just get around this covenant eyes by just doing this or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, they got the tricks, right? They, they're going to learn from their buddies at school. Now, once they've got that going, you start thinking, oh, are, are there any significant effects on the children if they get addicted to pornography? Yep, it will immediately stunt their emotional growth right where they start doing. Remember, you've seen those statistics where a person becomes addicted to alcohol mm -hmm. and their emotional growth just stunts right there. It stops there. Well, or drugs are the same thing. Well, uh, you know, it happens with pornography. I mean, it's basically, it's an emotional growth blocker. But the other thing that happens is suddenly that kid starts looking at the opposite gender, generally a boy mm -hmm. looking at the girl, with disrespect. They don't have that n personal connection. Right away, the empathy factor is getting blocked.
so that you know the kids empathy is not uh, not just not growing it's going backwards mm -hmm. it's decreasing when the empathy decreases what winds up happening is that the kid then doesn't look at this uh, a girl as a person he's looking at the girl as a thing mm -hmm. of uh, you know to gratify him mm -hmm. sexually and then of course what happens to the violence rate of those kids like sexual violence it goes skyrocketing upwards by the way there's very good studies in my book moral wisdom of the catholic church that show the exact numbers uh, for these increases then the next thing that happens of course teen pregnancies double and triple depending upon the amount of pornography that the child is viewing and then uh, on top of that uh, obviously uh, the, uh, the the boy involved will begin to um, uh, engage in very uh, hardcore pornography and very risky sexual behaviors as a young man well you can imagine once you get that off the ground as a teenager and you move into your adult life where your financial resources are more el destructo i mean this thing is like you know an epidemic within the culture but you know worse than that it's a pandemic it's mm -hmm. it's so utterly destructive it may be one of the most socially destructive i mean the idea of a victimless sin right. uh, thanks for bringing that those terms up because it's anything but victimless this is just a horrible horrible i mean it's a portal of of evil i mean the evil spirit's got his little doorway right into our hearts and pornography is the big one but two other things quickly mm -hmm. number one as pornography viewing increases depression increases i know it's counterintuitive you think well wait a minute this guy's mm -hmm. getting sexual elation on a you know a categorically increased scale why would he feel depressed because inside of him or her uh, what's going on is gee I don't like myself anymore mm -hmm. I feel like uh, not just a low life I feel like there's something negative about me I feel the loss of my empathy for people mm -hmm. and I turn it right back on me in other words uh, you know when when you start disconnecting from people you become indifferent to people when before you were a very caring person you were an empathetic person you, <coughs> you liked people well believe it or not when you stop caring <clears throat> and stop right. empathizing, people also start caring about you and right. stop empathizing with you. And do you notice? Of course you notice. And then you go, oh, the reason why is because I'm such a low life or whatever. You make some judgment on yourself, but that you turn your own lack of empathy reflected by others' lack of empathy for right. you because of your lack of empathy for them. You so, turn it back on you. But what you, The right. depression rate just right. goes what you, skyrocketing. What do you say to those out there? They say, well, the reason I feel bad and feel guilty is because you're laying this guilt trip on me about the church puts on people that that I shouldn't be doing this and if uh, and if that wasn't the mindset out there I wouldn't feel guilty and I'd be perfectly fine what do you say to that well in this culture if you're still feeling a huge um, you know uh, uh, a dose of guilt as it were from the church being laid upon mm -hmm. you when every single norm in our culture and, and remember social norming right mm -hmm. it always goes upward if I don't have a strong faith commitment and most of the people let's face it who go into a, a pornography addiction full-fledged without trying to resist it most religious people some may get addicted mm -hmm. but they're trying to fight it mm -hmm. and as long as they remain strongly religious for the sake of God they will try to fight it they'll try to go to confession they'll even get themselves on a um, on, on a, a covenant eyes mm -hmm. on you know where somebody else controls the password to remove it they'll get um, you know a buddy group you know an accountability mm -hmm. group uh, where they let two or three other guys in who can monitor your website, see where you're searching and so forth, they'll try to fight. But if they don't fight it, right, if they just go into a full, probably the religious aspect was not that strong. Then where do they default? They default, default to social norming. They start saying, oh, I'm going to determine my moral compass on where the mainstream is in the culture. Oh, look, I just read this statistic that says that, uh, you know, 95% of men uh, read pornography within uh, the last six months. 
well, right. gosh, you know, uh, you know, I, I may as well, you know, uh, or, uh, you know, there's 10% sexual addicts. Well, I'm not an addict yet. Oh, well, right. there's, you know, um, uh, 15 well, additional percent are habituated. Father, well, I'm about, not habituated uh, yet. There's like 100% uh, likelihood that we're out of time. So uh, if you would uh, <laughs> give us your blessing on the way out the door, that would be great, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord of all consolation, the Lord of all mercy, continue to batter your heart with that love, to heal you, to transform you, to make you a great example and model for your children and for the culture. May your religion always be the source of your light and your goodness. And may the light of Christ in the Eucharist continue to transform you until you have reached the full summit in his eternal kingdom of joy. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. Be well. We shall see you next time. And remember, Father's books and DVDs are available through our EWTN Religious Catalog and programs are on our on-demand page. Next week, we'll continue talking about, unfortunately, pornography. But uh, be there. There's some information. Also, on Bookmark, Loving God's Children, The Church and Gender Ideology by John Birch. Look for that interview coming up this weekend. And don't forget, the March for Life from Washington, D.C. all-day coverage begins Friday at 8 a.m. Eastern Time with the closing mass for the prayer vigil for life. Of course, the vigil's the night before, followed by the entire march, the 51st. And our pro-life coverage continues right through Saturday with the Walk for Life West Coast beginning at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. And there's uh, One Life L.A. as well and another mass. So stay with us all weekend long for completely extensive pro-life coverage like no other place can provide for you. I'm Doug Keck. This is Father Spitzer's Universe. We'll see you next time. Thanks.